James 3 through 13, 3, 13 through 18 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Everybody can take a seat. Thank you all. My name is Robert. I work in the Office of Spiritual Formation. There's a picture of me riding birds with my wife. Bring birds back, am I right? We're going to be talking about James 3, 13 through 18, as Camille just read for us. Before we get into that, I want to remind us that we're coming out of a week of faith and sexuality and those conversations. We're in March now. Some of you needed that announcement because you didn't know we weren't in February. And that means that we're also leaving behind Black History Month. And if you didn't get to go to anything that the Black Students Union or OMA or anybody like that put on, you really missed a lot of great opportunities. Afram Festival was this past Saturday. I brought this. It was amazing. It was such a great event. So as we're coming out of that um, and all of those good things, I want to just bring everybody back in and remind them that we're talking about James. And our theme is Devoted. And, and as we talk about James and we talk about this book that was written, it's about decision, action, wisdom, and devotion. I want to start today out by telling you guys a story. So I went to ACU for my undergrad, and I worked at Chick-fil-A, the one right down by Walmart. And I worked there my freshman and my junior year. And what was really awesome about Chick-fil-A at that time is that you could get like anything on the menu during your break, which as you know as college students is worth its weight in gold. So we would go on our breaks or whatever, we would get Chick-fil-A sandwiches, nuggets, and everything. But the catch was, we only had 10 minutes to eat that chicken. So naturally, as freshman young men whose frontal lobes were not done forming yet, we had competitions about who could eat the chicken in the least amount of bites. And I want to let you know that I ate one of those bad boys in three bites, and I nearly sealed these words, choked on chicken, as the title of my obituary. So we were all eating all this chicken and forcing it down our throats because we thought that was a good idea. And yet, it was all worth it. I almost died, and it would have been my pleasure serving Abilene soccer moms <laughs> and ACU girls their eight counts lemonades and plenty of Chick-fil-A sauce. But I think there was more things in store, right? There was something else to come. And Chick-fil-A was good, it was fast, it was convenient, but the three-bite chicken sandwich was just a bad idea. So on to a different story about food. This is one that you probably know. There was a man and there was a woman and they were in a garden. You know this one, right? And they were naming the animals and wandering around and the woman one day finds herself in a conversation with a serpent. And the serpent says to her, is it true that God said that you can't eat of any of the fruit of the garden? And the woman thinks, she says, well, no, we can, we just can't eat of that one. And if we do, we'll die. Well, the serpent guarantees she won't die. He makes this promise of life to the woman. He tempts her. And the woman, enticed by the beauty of the fruit, seeing that it could give her wisdom and that it would fill her up, she takes of it, she takes a bite, she gives some to her husband, and the strangest thing happened. They didn't die. They just started to. And I thought, what? What is going on here in this early, early text, the earliest story we have from Scripture? It says something about wisdom being in the fruit, and does wisdom lead to death? Is that what the woman is saying? Surely not. Surely there's something more to wisdom. What Adam and Eve didn't know and what we're talking about today is what we're missing out on when we submit to when we don't submit to the wisdom of God and we rather submit to the wisdom of the serpent. So what does all of this have to do with James 3, 13 through 18? Well, James, like we said, is writing a letter of action, of decision, of devotion and wisdom. And for James, the brother of Jesus, there are two types of wisdom. 
There's a wisdom from God and above, and there's a wisdom from the serpent and the world, and there's a big difference between the two. The wisdom of the serpent, as we saw and as Camille read in 3.14 through 16, tells us that if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, that you should not boast or be false to the truth. So there's this sense in which we have this bitter jealousy, and the wisdom of the serpent is telling us to be like other people, that we're jealous of what they have and what they do. And there's also a sense in which we have this selfish ambition, which is just telling us that we're better than other people. And what's strange about those two is that they rear their ugly heads in very similar ways. So if the question was, did Adam and Eve have bitter jealousy towards God or selfish ambition, it's almost yes. And we feel the effects of this false wisdom. I've felt the effects of this false wisdom. Do you feel like sometimes something's telling you that you're not enough? Or also other times when something's telling you that you're even better than the neighbor next to you? Both of these are lies. Both are death. Or like the man and the woman in the garden, they're just the beginning of death. And the reason they're death is because they're begging you to look introspectively to just yourself. They're inviting you into competition with your neighbor rather than community. They're inviting you to put all of your stock, all of your anxiety, all of your focus, everything into just you. And you've got to take care of yourself, but there's a lot more than that. There's Christian community that God has designed for us, and it's beautiful. This is a life that we think of of ifs and thens. That if I just had a job like them, if I just made as much money as them, if I just had the relationship status like them, if I just used the right filter, whatever, then I'll be enough. Or in the same breath, then I'll be better. And both are lies, and both are death, or at least they're just the beginning of it. And we don't need to live a life of ifs and thens. It focuses us on the beautification of ourselves rather than living for the beauty of other people. It's like a facelift. It's not facing it, facing the fact that there's life on the line whenever we know that there's a God who's designed community and love for us and has so much more to offer than we can imagine. This reminds me of another passage in James that my brother David Gasatura spoke to us about at the beginning of the semester. It's James 1, 14 through 15. And it says, but each person is tempted when they are lured and enticed by their own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James is warning us about the wisdom of the serpent. He's reminding us in this this analogy of, of birth and growth that these things that we desire in our selfish, the selfishness of our hearts will always lead us to death. He says that there's something more. There's a redeemed process that rather than living into the wisdom of Satan, which tells you to listen to your immediate desires and then gives you sinful fruits that grow into death, there's something more. There's living into the wisdom of God, which leads you to actions of peace that ask us to wait and trust in him so that he can bring about life. This wisdom is first pure, then peaceable. It's gentle. It's open to reason. It's full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Did you hear that? Good fruits. From the beginning of time in the garden with Adam and Eve to thousands of years later to the coming of Christ to this moment right now, it's about trusting in the good fruits that God does give to us rather than focusing on the bad fruits that lead to sin and death. And before we miss this very crucial last part of the passage, this very last verse, almost as if it's thumbtacked onto the end, that we don't even hardly expect it, it says, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is a promise that's given to us by God, a promise that Satan couldn't give to us in the garden and he can't give to us now. In fact, he's he's crafty, maybe even a little bit genius in what he does, but his efforts always sum up to death. The promise of our God is a promise of peace and life. The promise isn't fulfilled in foolishness, but for James in wisdom, and not this ethereal wisdom that floats around in the minds of philosophers or up in the clouds, but a wisdom of devotion, a wisdom of daily actions of peace, a promise that only God could make to us. Wisdom is about saying my life is more important than how I look or how I feel in this moment or how others perceive me, but about how God looks at me and how God feels about me. And it's this look of God and this love that he has for us that turns us 
in joy and in love towards others in community. So you remember my first story about Chick-fil-A, the choking, the 10 minutes, all that? After I graduated college, I went and I worked at Copper Creek for a few months. It's this really nice steakhouse outside of town. And Copper Creek, very unlike Chick-fil-A, is not a restaurant focused on speed and convenience. Copper Creek, and don't drool here, is about 14-ounce ribeyes. It's about truffle mashed potatoes, loaded mashed potatoes. It's about fruits and, and vegetables that have been grown for a long time to enter your mouth on a Saturday night. Copper Creek was much more than I could have imagined, but my freshman Chick-fil-A mind told me that that was everything. And it was the celebratory Saturday nights that I spent so many occasions with, with so many people that showed me where the beauty of wisdom of God actually comes from. It was most clearly shown to me when this French couple uh, visited their son who was graduating from McMurray, I think, and he'd spent four years away from home working very hard and achieving this degree. And they sit down, and you guys know Americans, even at nice places like Copper Creek, we get these people in and out in an hour. The French people know. They wanted to spend much longer there. And I served this table for nearly five hours. These people got the first drinks and then the appetizers and then the entrees and the desserts and then coffee afterwards. And I started to notice that I was offending them by how often I was checking on the table when he stopped me and said, Monsieur, we are trying to enjoy our time here. We are celebrating. And I said, oh, goodness. <laughs> um, we. And I walked away and I didn't visit for a long, long time. So what I want you guys to know is that wisdom is like a celebration of coming to a table full of good fruits that don't just happen overnight. Wisdom is like waiting and looking towards the good fruits of the kingdom, the good fruits that have a promise behind them. The good fruits like contentment when you don't get the job you expected, the good fruits like patience whenever you're not getting your way, the good fruits like joy when your friends succeed rather than competing against them, and the good fruits like rejoicing in trials that James opens up his letter with. I want to be frank and say that some of you don't know, don't know Jesus, and you may even think that you don't need him. But if you're settling right now for the bad fruits of the world, the fruits that promise life but deliver in death, the fruits that leave you in shame like the man and woman in the garden, the fruits that cause you to lash out in anger and frustration against those whom you love, the fruits that beg you to compete with your friends rather than celebrate with them for what God has done, I want to let you know that there's a table that offers so, so much more. The table that doesn't force fleeting desires down your throat in three bites or less. The table where the Father says your devotion has not gone unnoticed. Who you have become in the consistent, the steady, the daily decisions of wisdom and peace will bring about life. They will bring about life as I give you glimpses of my kingdom here on this earth, and they'll bring about life forevermore. Stop settling for desire and death when there are good fruits from God that lead to life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak truth in a room, God, that we would consistently be reminded of your goodness and your faithfulness. Father, I want to pray a blessing over these students that they would learn to love you more, that we would all learn to love you more, God, that we would trust in the good fruits that you have given to us, which are so many, instead of looking to the one that is not from you, God. We love you, Lord. We're thankful for just who you are and rejoicing in a God who is good. We love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.